Hey everyone, ready for a deep dive into something really thought-provoking. Today we're looking at academia, but get this, through the lens of remote sensing, you know, satellites, data, all that cool stuff. It's really fascinating how much we can learn about our planet from afar. Right. But we're not just looking at the tech itself today. We're digging into a research article that's like shining a spotlight on inclusivity in this field. And honestly, it's about way more than just remote sensing. It's about power dynamics. Who gets to decide what research matters? The whole shebang. Yeah, the article kind of throws down the gauntlet right from the start, comparing academia to a game. A game? Tell me more about that. Well, they're saying that the way success is measured, who gets to set the rules, it's all kind of skewed, you know? Like who gets published, who gets cited, who gets the funding. Exactly. And they're arguing that those metrics, while they seem objective, they're often influenced by a very specific group. So it's like a self-perpetuating cycle. Pretty much. And what they're saying is, if we want to create a level playing field, we need to change the rules of the game. I'm totally here for shaking things up. But let's get specific. How does this all play out in the field of remote sensing? Well, they get into the nitty gritty with this research. OK, lay it on me. So they did this whole audit of editorial boards. Editorial boards, like the people who decide what gets published in scientific journals. Yep, exactly. They looked at 30 major remote sensing journals, analyzing them for gender and geographic representation. And what did they find? Don't hold back now. Well, it's um, let's just say it's not a pretty picture. Out of the top 10 journals, you know, the ones with the highest impact factor. Impact factor, meaning they're seen as the most influential in the field. Exactly. Eight out of those 10 had editorial boards that were over 80 percent male. 80 percent. Seriously. Seriously. And that's just the gender disparity. They also found that a whopping 52 percent of editorial board members came from just four countries. Hold on. So more than half the decision making power in this field is concentrated in the hands of people from just four countries. That's not exactly a recipe for diverse perspectives, is it? No, it's not. And it's not just about representation for representation's sake, right? This has real consequences. Absolutely. It shapes the kind of research that gets funded, the direction the field takes, even the solutions we come up with. OK, so let's talk about those consequences. How does this lack of diversity actually play out? What are the impacts? Well, for starters, there's the issue of who gets to decide what research is considered important? Right, because if you have a homogeneous group of people making those decisions... You end up with a very narrow view of what matters. And that can be a huge problem, especially in a field like remote sensing that has the potential to address so many global challenges. So it's not just about whose voices are heard. It's about whose knowledge is valued, whose experiences are taken into account. Exactly. And the article actually points to something called the Matilda effect. The Matilda effect. That sounds kind of ominous. What is it? It's this phenomenon where women's contributions to science often get overlooked or even attributed to men. Oh, wow. Like that thing with Rosalind Franklin and her work on DNA. Exactly. Hmm. Her research was crucial to Watson and Crick's discovery of the double helix structure, but she didn't get the credit she deserved for decades. It's like she was written out of history. Mm. And I'm guessing this kind of thing happens more than we realize. Way more. And it's not limited to just gender. Researchers from the global south, those from marginalized communities, they often face an uphill battle getting their work recognized and funded. So we're not just talking about a lack of representation. We're talking about a potential loss of groundbreaking research and ideas. Exactly. We might be missing out on crucial discoveries and solutions because we're not tapping into the full potential of the scientific community. This is really making me think about the whole system of academia. Yeah. It's like, are we really nurturing the best and brightest minds or are we just perpetuating the status quo? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? And it's something that this article really forces us to grapple with. So where do we go from here? Is there any hope for change? Actually, the authors of this article are surprisingly optimistic. They see this as a call to action, a chance to rebuild the system in a way that's more equitable and just. OK, I like the sound of that. But how do we get there? What needs to change? Give me the action items. Well, they have a whole multi-pronged approach. But the first step, they argue, is data collection. Data collection. What do you mean? I mean, we can't fix a problem if we don't know the extent of it, right? That makes sense. So journals, professional organizations, universities, they need to start actively gathering demographic data. They need to track diversity within their ranks, figure out where the biggest problems are. Knowledge is power, as yeah. they say. 
or at least it's the first step. Exactly. And once we have that data, we can start implementing targeted solutions. Like what, what else do they suggest? Well, one big thing they emphasize is the need to diversify those editorial boards we were talking about earlier. So shaking up the status quo a bit, making sure a wider range of voices are involved in deciding what research gets seen as valuable? Precisely. It's about changing the power dynamics within the field, making sure that decisions about what research gets funded and published are made by a more representative group of people. Okay, that sounds like a good place to start. But are there any, like, structural changes they propose? <laughs> Something that gets at the root of the problem? Absolutely. They even suggest exploring different approaches to the peer review process itself. Peer review. You mean the way research papers are evaluated before they're published? Exactly. They even bring up the idea of implementing double blind reviews. Double blind reviews. I've never heard of that. What is it? Basically, it means that both the authors of a research paper and the reviewers who are evaluating it are anonymous to each other. Wait, so you have no idea who you're reviewing and they have no idea who you are. Exactly. It's a way to try and eliminate any unconscious bias that might be creeping into the review process. Wow, that's actually really interesting. I could see how that would help level the playing field, at least during the evaluation process. Right. The idea is that the research should speak for itself, not the reputation or background of the researchers. I like that. So we've got data transparency, we've got diversifying decision-making bodies, and we've got potentially rethinking peer review. That's a pretty solid start, I'd say. It is, but they don't stop there. They also talk about the importance of actively promoting the work of researchers from underrepresented backgrounds. Tell me more about that. What does that look like in practice? Well, it could involve things like highlighting their work in publications, inviting them to speak at conferences, nominating them for awards, basically making sure their voices are heard and their contributions are recognized. So it's about more than just removing barriers. It's about actively creating opportunities. Yes. And it's not just about individual researchers either. They also challenge journals to consider publishing more multidisciplinary work research that crosses traditional boundaries and might not fit neatly into existing categories. Because when you break down those silos between disciplines, you get this amazing cross-pollination of ideas, right? Suddenly you're seeing the world through a completely different lens. Exactly. And that's often where the most groundbreaking discoveries happen, at the interception of different fields. This is really resonating with me. We talk so much about diversity and inclusion, but this article actually lays out a roadmap for making it happen. It does. And it also makes the point that this isn't just about doing the right thing, although of course that's important, but it's also about enriching the scientific endeavor as a whole. Because by bringing in diverse perspectives, we're going to see more creative solutions, more groundbreaking research, a deeper understanding of the world around us. Exactly. It's a win-win for everyone. I'm convinced. So we've explored the challenges, we've dug into the solutions, but now I'm curious to zoom out a bit. What does all of this mean for other fields? Is remote sensing just the tip of the iceberg? That's a great question, and it's one we'll be exploring in the final part of this deep dive. Stay tuned. Welcome back, everyone. So last time, we dove headfirst into this fascinating, okay, maybe slightly alarming, research on inclusivity in remote sensing. Yeah, it definitely gets you thinking, right? It does. And we left off talking about the potential for a brain drain in science. Can you refresh our memory on that? Right. So it's basically this idea that when talented individuals, especially those from underrepresented backgrounds, don't feel valued or supported. They leave. They leave. They take their talent, their skills, their potential elsewhere. And science loses out. Hmm. But is it really that bad? I mean, is academia really that broken? It's not about broken. It's about well, it's about recognizing that the way we've always done things might not be the best way. I like that. So how do we fix it? Where do we even start? Well, the authors of this article are actually pretty optimistic. They see this as a real opportunity for positive change. Okay, I like the sound of that. All right. But how do we get from optimistic to actually making a difference? Well, they actually lay out a pretty comprehensive action plan, and it starts with something surprisingly simple. Okay, I'm intrigued. Hit me with it. Data. Data collection. Data collection. Yeah. That doesn't sound very revolutionary. I know, right? But it's crucial. You can't solve a problem if you don't know the extent of it. Makes sense. So they're basically saying journals, professionals, societies, universities, all of them need to be actively gathering demographic data. Okay, so we need to know who's at the table, who's not, yeah. and where the biggest gaps are. Exactly. And then we can start to develop targeted solutions based on that data. Love it. So 
Data is step one. What's next? Well, this one's a bit more about shaking things up. They talk about diversifying those editorial and review boards we mentioned earlier. Right, the gatekeepers of scientific publishing. Exactly. We're talking about being more intentional about recruiting reviewers from underrepresented backgrounds, making sure those boards are more reflective of the diversity of the scientific community. So it's about more than just adding a few different faces to the mix. It's about fundamentally changing who gets to decide what research is considered valuable. Precisely. It's about shifting the power dynamics within these fields. I'm all for it. But are there any, like, structural changes they propose? Anything that gets at the root of the problem? Absolutely. They actually suggest exploring different approaches to peer review. Peer review? You mean like how research papers are evaluated before they get published? Exactly. They even suggest trying out something called double-blind review. Double-blind review? What in the world is that? It's pretty fascinating, actually. It basically means that both the authors of the research paper and the reviewers who are evaluating it, they're anonymous to each other. Wait, so you have no idea who you're reviewing and they have no idea who you are. Exactly. Wow, that's wild. But I can see how that would be really helpful in eliminating bias, right? Exactly. The research is judged on its merits, not on the reputation or background of the people who did it. Okay, that is a seriously cool idea. Yeah. So we've got data transparency, diversifying the decision-making bodies, rethinking peer review, what else? Well, they also talk about the importance of actively promoting the work of researchers from underrepresented backgrounds. Okay, so not just removing barriers, but actively creating opportunities. Exactly. And it could be as simple as making sure their research is highlighted in publications, inviting them to speak at conferences, nominating them for awards. It's about amplifying their voices and making sure their contributions are recognized. I love that. It's about creating a culture where everyone feels seen and valued. Absolutely. And it's not just about individual researchers either. They challenge journals to publish more multidisciplinary work. Multidisciplinary work. You mean research that spans different fields? Yes. Research that might not fit neatly into those traditional categories, you know. Because sometimes the most groundbreaking stuff happens when you break down those silos between disciplines. It's like seeing the world with fresh eyes. That's exactly it. This is really resonating with me. It's like we talk so much about diversity and inclusion, but this article actually gives us a concrete roadmap for making it happen. And they make another really important point. Oh, what is that? This isn't just about doing the right thing, although it definitely is the right thing to do. Of course, yeah. But it's also about, and this is crucial, it's about enriching the scientific endeavor as a whole. Because when you bring in more diverse perspective, you get more creative solutions, you get more groundbreaking research, you get a deeper understanding of the world around us. It's a win-win for everyone. This yeah. has been so eye-opening. Mm -hmm. But I am curious, we've been talking a lot about remote sensing. Yeah. yeah. But does this apply to other fields too? Is this just the tip of the iceberg? Welcome back to the show. We've been on quite a journey with this deep dive into inclusivity in science. It's definitely been thought-provoking, to say the least. It really has. We've talked about the challenges, the potential solutions, but I feel like it's time to zoom out a bit, look at the bigger picture. Absolutely. This whole conversation about remote sensing, it really has implications for science as a whole. It's like we're holding up a mirror right. to the entire scientific community. It's asking us to confront some hard truths about who gets to participate, whose voices are heard, who gets to shape the direction of entire fields. Exactly. And those questions are more important than ever, especially now, with science playing such a huge role in tackling these massive global challenges. Climate change, food security, you name it. Exactly. We need all hands on deck, right? And that means making sure everyone feels welcome and valued in the scientific community. Because if we're relying on a small, homogenous group of people to solve these huge, complex problems... We're missing out, big time, on different perspectives, innovative solutions, a true understanding of the problems themselves. So where do we go from here? How do we take these insights about remote sensing and apply them more broadly? How do we create real change across all scientific disciplines? Well, the article actually gives us a good starting point. Remember that multi-pronged action plan we talked about? Data collection. Diversifying leadership. Rethinking peer review. Exactly. Those strategies are relevant across the board. Right. It's about changing the system itself, the systems and structures that perpetuate bias, no matter the field. It's about changing the culture of science. 
challenging those deeply ingrained assumptions about what constitutes good science and who gets to decide. And recognizing that scientific excellence depends on inclusivity. 100%. It's not one or the other. It's both. And they're inseparable. I love that. So it's about changing the system, but it's also about changing ourselves, right? Absolutely. It's about asking ourselves some tough questions. Whose voices are missing from the conversation? Whose perspectives are not being considered? What can we each do in our own small way to make a difference? Because we all have a role to play. Whether we're seasoned researchers, students just starting out, or just curious people who are passionate about science. And I truly believe that a more inclusive, equitable scientific community, it benefits everyone. We get new ideas, new solutions, a deeper understanding of the world. It's a win-win for everyone and for the planet. Well, that brings us to the end of our deep dive. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling both inspired and fired up to make a difference. Me too. And remember, this is just the beginning of the conversation. Keep asking questions, keep challenging the status quo, and keep pushing for a more inclusive, equitable future for science. And keep learning, keep exploring, and never stop being curious about the world around you. Thanks for joining us.